Chapter 16 Jones and Wilsons crawled westward as a unit, El Reno and Bridgeport, Clinton, Elk City, Sayre, and Texola. There's the border, and Oklahoma was behind. And this day, the cars crawled on and on, through the panhandle of Texas, Shamrock and Al, Alan Reed, Groom and Yarnell. They went through Amarillo in the evening, drove too long, and camped when it was dusk. They were tired and dusty and hot. Grandma had convulsions from the heat, and she was too weak. She was weak when they stopped. That night, Al stole a fence rail and made a ridge pole on the truck, braced at both ends. That night, they ate nothing but pan biscuits, cold and hard, held over from the breakfast. They flopped down on the mattresses and slept in their clothes. The Wilsons didn't even put up their tent. The Joes and Wilsons were in flight across the panhandle, the rolling gray country, lined and cut with old flood scars. They were in flight out of Oklahoma and across Texas. The land turtles crawled through the dust and the sun whipped the earth. And in the evening, the heat went out of the sky and the earth sent, uh, set up, sent up a wave of heat from itself. Two days, the families were in flight. But on the third, the land was too huge for them and they settled into a new technique of living. The highway became their home and movement their medium of expression. Little by little, they settled into new, into the new life. Ruthie and Winfield first, then Al, then Connie and Rose Sharon, and last, the older ones. The land rolled like great stationary ground swells. Wilderado and Vega and Boise and Glen Rio. That's the end of Texas. New Mexico and the mountains. In the far distance, waved up against the sky, the mountains stood. And the wheels of the cars creaked around, and the engines were hot and the steam spurted around the radiator caps. They crawled to the Pecos River and crossed at Santa Rosa, and they went on for 20 miles. Al drove, drove the touring car, and his mother sat beside him, and Rosa Sharon beside her. Ahead, the truck crawled, the hot air folded in waves over the land, and the mountains shivered in the heat. Al drove listlessly hunched back in the seat, his hand hooked easily over the crossbar of the steering wheel. His gray hat, peaked and pulled into an incredibly sh cocky shape, was low over one eye, and as he drove, he turned and spat out the side now and then. Ma beside him had folded her hands in her lap and re had retired into a resistance against weariness. She sat loosely, letting the movement of the car sway her body, and her head. She squinted her eyes ahead at the mountains. Rose of Sharon was braced against the mount and movement of the car. Her feet pushed tight against the floor, and her elbow hooked over the door. And her plump face was tight against the movement, and her head jiggled sharply because her neck muscles were tight. She tried to arch her whole body as a rigid container to preserve her fetus from shock. She turned her head towards her mother. Ma, she said. Ma's eyes lighted up and she drew her attention towards Rose Sharon. Her eyes went over to the tight, tired, plump face and she smiled. Ma, the girl said, when we get there, are you going to pick fruit and kind of live in the country, ain't you? Ma smiled a little satirically. We ain't there yet, she said. We don't know what's it like. We gotta see. Me and Connie don't want to live in the country no more, the girl said. We gotta, we got it all planned up what we're going to do. For a moment, a little worry came on Ma's face. Ain't you gonna stay with us, with the family, she asked. Well, we talked all about it, me and Connie. Ma, we want to live in a town. She went on excitedly. Connie is gonna get a job in a store, or maybe a factory, and he's gonna study at home, maybe radio, so he can get to be an expert, and maybe later have his own store. And we'll go to the pictures whenever. And Connie says I'm gonna have a doctor when the baby's born and what he and he says we'll know how times is and maybe I'll go to a hospital and we'll have a car a little car and after he studies at night why it'll be nice and he tore a page out of western love stories and he's gonna send off for a course because they don't cost nothing to send off it says right on that clipping I seen it and why they even got it <laughs> get you a good job when you take that course radios it is nice clean work and a future and we'll live in 
town and go to pitchers whenever. And well, I'm going to have electric iron and the baby will have all new stuff. Connie says all new stuff. White and well, you've seen the catalog, all the stuff they got for a baby. Maybe right at first when Connie's studying at home, it won't be easy. But, well, when the baby comes, maybe he'll all be done studying and we'll have a place, a little bit of a place. We don't want nothing fancy, but we want it nice for the baby. Her face glowed with excitement. And I thought, well, I thought maybe we could all go into in town. And when Connie gets his store, maybe Al could work for him. Ma's eyes had never uh, left the flushing face. Ma watched the structure grow and followed it. We don't want you to go away from us, she said. It ain't good for folks to break up. Al snorted. Me walk, work for Connie? How about Connie comes working for me? He thinks he's the only son of a bitch who can study at night? Ma suddenly seemed to know it was all a dream. She turned her eyes forward again, and her body relaxed, but a little smile stayed in her eyes. I wonder how Grandma feels today, she said. Al grew tense over the wheel. A little rattle had developed in the engine. He speeded up and the rattle increased. He retarded his spike, his spark, and listened. And then he speeded up for a moment and listened. The rattle increased with a to a metallic pounding. Al blew his horn and pulled the, si uh, the car to the side of the road. Ahead, the truck pulled up and then back slowly. Three cars raced by, westward. Each of one blew its horn. And the last driver leaned out and yelled, Where the hell you think you're stopping? Tom backed the, tr uh, the truck close, and then he got out and walked towards the, to the touring car. From the back of the loaded truck, heads looked on him. Al retarded his a spark and listened to the, his idling motor. Tom asked, what's the matter, Al? Al speeded the motor. Listen to her. The rattling pound was louder now. Tom listened. Put your spark in idle, he said. He opened the hood and put his head inside. Now speed her. He listened for a moment, then closed the hood. Well, I guess you're right, Al, he said. Conrad bearing it in it? Sounds like it, said Tom. I kept plenty of oil in, Al complained. Well, well, it just didn't get to her. Dry them, bitch monkey now. Well, there ain't nothing to do but tear her out. Look, I'll pull ahead and find a, fat, a flat pace to stop. You come ahead slow. Don't knock the pan out of her. Wilson asked, is it bad? Pretty bad, said Tom, and walked back to the truck and moved slowly ahead. Al explained, I don't know what made her go out. I give her plenty of oil. Al knew the blame was on him. He felt his failure. Ma said, it ain't your fault. You done everything right. And then she asked a little timidly, is it terrible bad? Well, it's hard to get at, and we gotta get a new Conrad, or else something, some babbit in this one. He sighed deeply at I sure am glad Tom's here. I never fit in no bearing. Hope to uh, Jesus Tom did. A huge red billboard stood beside the road ahead, and then and it threw a great oblong shadow. Tom edged the truck off the road and across the shallow roadside ditch, and he pulled up in the shadow. He got out and waited until Al came up. Now easy, he called. Take her slow or you'll break a spring too. Al's face went red with anger. He throttled down his motor. God damn it, he yelled. I didn't burn that baron out. What do you mean? I bust a spring too. Tom grinned. Keep all four feet on the ground, he said. I didn't mean nothing. Just take her easy over the ditch. Al grumbled as he inched the touring car down and up the other side. Don't you go and give nobody no idea. I burned out that baron. The engine clattered loudly now. Al pulled into the shade and shut off the motor. Tom lifted the hood up and braced it. Can't even start on her before she cools off, he said. The family piled down from the car and clustered around about the torn car. Tom asked, how bad? And he squatted on his hams. Tom turned to Al. Ever fitted one? No, said Al. I never. Of course I had pans off. Tom said, well, we got to tear the pan off and get the rod out, and we got to get a new part and honer and shimmer and fitter. Good day's job. Gotta go back to that last place for a part. Santa Rosa. Albuquerque is about 70 files on. Oh, Jesus. Tomorrow's Sunday. We can't get nothing tomorrow. The family stood silently. Ruthie crept close and peered 
into the open hood, hoping to see the broken part. Tom went on softly. Tomorrow's Sunday. Monday we'll get this thing and probably won't get her fitted before Tuesday. We ain't got the tools to make it easy. Gonna be a job. The shadow of a buzzard slid across the earth, and the family all looked up at the sailing black bird. Pa said, What I'm scared is that we'll run out of money so we can't get there at all. Here's, uh, here's all of us eating and got to buy gas and oil. If we run out of money, I don't know what we're going to do. Wilson says, seems like it's my fault. This here goddamn wreck give me trouble right along. You folks been nice to us. Now you just pack up and get along. Me and Sari will stay and we'll figure some way. We don't aim to put you folks out now. Pa says slowly, we ain't going to do it. We almost got a kin bond. Grandpa, he died in your tent. Sari said tiredly, we've been nothing but trouble, nothing but trouble. Tom made a, uh, slowly made a cigarette and inspected and lighted it. He took off his ruined cap and wiped his forehead. I got an idea, he said. Maybe nobody's going to like it, but uh, but here she is. The nearer to California our folks get, the quicker there's going to be money rolling. Now this here car will go twice as, uh, twice as fast as that truck. Now here's my idea. You take out some of that stuff in the truck, and then you, all you folks, but me and the preacher, get in and move on. Me and Casey will stop here and fix this here car, and then we drive on, day and night, and we'll catch up. Or if we j don't meet on the road, you'll be a working anyway. And if you break down, why, just camp alongside the road till we come. You can't be no worse off, and if you get through, why, you'll be a working, and stuff will be easy. Casey can give me a lift with this car, uh, here car, and we'll come a-sailing. The gathered family considered it. Uncle John dropped his, uh, to his hands beside Pa. Al said, Won't you need me to give you a hand on, with that, Conrad? You said yourself you never fixed one. That's right, Al agreed. All you gotta have is strong back. Maybe the preacher don't want to stay. Well, whoever, I don't care, said Tom. Pa scratched the dry earth with his, with his forefinger. I got a notion Tom's right, he said. It ain't gonna do no good, uh, all of us staying here. We can get fifty hundred miles for dark. Ma said worriedly, how are you gonna find us? We're on the same road, 66 right on through. Come to a place uh, named Bakersfield, seen it on the map I got. You go straight on there. Yeah, but when we get to California and spread out sideways off the road, don't worry, we're gonna find you. California and the whole world. Looks like an awful big place on the map. Pa appealed for advice. John, you see any reason why not? No, said John. Mr. Wilson, it's your car. You got any objections if my boy fixes her and brings her on? I don't see none. Seems like you folks done everything for us already. Don't see why I can't give your boy a hand. You can be working laying in a little money if we don't catch up with you, said Tom. And suppose we all just lay around here. There ain't no water here, and we can't have, and we can't move this here car. But suppose you get out there and get to work. Why do you, uh, you'd have money, and maybe a house to live in? How about that, Casey? Want to stay with me and give me a lift? I want to do whatever is best for you folks," said Casey. "You took me in and carried me along. I'll do whatever." "Well, you'll lay your on your back and get grease in your face if you stay here," said Tom. "Suits me all right." Pa said, well, if that's uh, the way she's going to go, we better get a shoving. We can maybe squeeze in a hundred miles f before we stop. Ma stepped in front of him. I ain't uh, going to go. What do you mean you ain't uh, going to go? You got to go. You got to look after the family. Pa was amazed at the revolt. Ma stepped to the torn car and reached in on the floor uh, of the back seat. She, she brought out a jack handle and balanced it on her hand easily. I ain't uh, going to go, she said. I tell you, you got to go. We made up our mind. Now Ma's mouth was hard, set hard. She said softly, Only way you're going to get me to go is whoop me. She moved the jack handle gently again. And I'll shame you, Pa. I won't take no whooping. Crying and begging, I'll light into to you. And you ain't so sure you can whoop me anyways. And if you do get me, I swear to God I'll wait till you got your back turned and you're sitting down, and I'll knock you belly up with a bucket. I swear to holy Jesus' sake, I will. Pa looked helplessly at, about the group. 
She's sassy, he said. I never seen her so sassy. Ruthie giggled shrilly. The jack handle, handle flicked hungrily, hungrily back and forth in Ma's hand. Come on, said Ma. You made up your mind. Come and, and whoop me. Just try it. But I ain't a going. And if I do, you ain't gonna get no sleep. Cause I'll wait and I'll wait. And just the minute you take sleep in your eyes, I'll slap you with a stick of stove wood. So goddamn sassy, Pa murmured. And she ain't young neither. The whole group watched the revolt. They watched Pa waiting for him to break into fury. They watched his lax hands to see the fist forms. Pa's anger did, did not rise and his hands hung limply at his sides. And in a moment, the group knew that Ma had won, and Ma knew it too. Tom said, Ma, what's eating you? What you want to uh, do this way for? What's the matter with you anyway? You gone John Rabbit on us? Ma's face softened, but her eyes were still fierce. You done this without thinking too uh, much, and Ma, Ma said. When, uh, when we got left in the world, nothing but us, nothing but the folks. We come out, and Grandpa, he reached with, uh, for the shovel shelf right off. And now, right off, you want to bust up the folks. Tom cried, Ma, we were going to catch up with you. Well, we wasn't going to be gone long. Ma waved the jack handle. Suppose we was camp and you went on back. Suppose we got on through. How did we know where to leave the word? And how did you know where to ask? He said, we got a bitter road. Grandma's sick. She's up there on the truck upon for a shovel herself. She's just tired out. We got a long bitter road ahead, Uncle John said. But we could make be making some money. We could have a little bit saved up. Come time the fo other folks got there. The eyes of the whole family shifted back to Ma. She was in the, uh, she was the power. She had taken control. The money we'd make wouldn't do no good. All we got is a family is the family unbroke like a bunch of cows when the lobos are arranging stick to all together. I ain't scared. While we're all here, all that's alive, but I ain't gonna see us bust up. The Wilsons here with, is with us, and the preacher is with us. I can't say nothing if they want to go, but I'm a gonna cat wild with this here piece of a bear ant barn if my folks bust up. Her f tone was cold and final. Tom said soothingly, Ma, we can't all camp here. Ain't no water here. Ain't even much shade here. Grandpa, she needs shade. All right, we'll go along. We'll stop the first place they shade water and shade, and the truck will be uh, the truck will come back and take you into town to get your part, and it'll bring you uh, you back. You ain't gonna go walking along the sun, and I ain't having you out uh, all alone. So if you get picked up, there ain't nobody of your folks to help you. Tom drew his lips over his teeth and then snapped them open. He spread his hands helplessly and let them flop against his sides. Pa, he said, if you was to rush her one side and me the other, and the rest of us pile on, Grandpa jump down on top. Maybe we can get Ma without, uh, without more than two, of us, uh, two, three of us gets killed with that their jack handle but if you ain't willing to get your head smashed i guess ma's went and filled her flush jesus christ one person with their mind made up can shove a lot of folks around you win ma put away that jack handle before you hurt somebody ma looked in astonishment at the bar of iron her hand trembled she dropped her weapon on the ground and tom with elaborate care picked it up and put it back in the car he said pa you just got set back on your heels. Al, drive, you drive the folks on and get them camped. And then you bring the truck back here. Me and the preacher will get the pan off. Then, we, if we can make it, we'll run in Santa Rosa and try and get a Conrad. Maybe we can, seeing it, it's Saturday night. Get, in, get jumping now so we can go. Let me have the monkey wrench and the pliers out of the truck. He reached under the car and felt the greasy pan. Oh yeah, let me have a can, that old bucket to catch oil. Gotta say that. Al handed over the bucket and Tom set it under the car and loosened the oil cup with a pair of pliers. The black oil flowed down his arm while he unscrewed the cap with his fingers and the black stream ran silently down into the bucket. Al had loaded the family on the truck by the time the bucket was half full. Tom, his face already smudged with oil, looked out uh, between the wheels. Get back fast, he called. 
and he was loosening the pen bolts as the truck moved gently across the shallow ditch and crawled away. Tom turned each bolt in a single turn, loosening them evenly to spare the gasket. The preacher knelt beside the wheels. What can I do? Nothing. Not right now. Soon the oil's out, and I, I get these here boots, uh, bolts loose. You can help me drop the pan off. He squirmed away under the car, loosening the bolts with a wrench and turning them out with his finger. He left the bolts on each end loosely threaded to keep the pan from dropping. Brown's still hot under here, said Tom, and then said, Say, Casey, you've been aw awful great, goddamn quiet the last few days. Why, Jesus, when I first come up with you, you was making a speech every half hour or so, and here you ain't said ten words the last couple days. What's the matter? Getting sour? Casey was stretched out on his stomach, looking under the car. His chin bristled with spare whiskers, rested on the back of one hand. His hat was pushed back so that it covered the back of his neck. I'd done enough talking when I was a preacher to last the rest of my life, he said. Yeah, but you done some talking sense, too. I'm all worried up, Casey said. I didn't even know uh, it was when I was uh, preaching around, but I was do uh, doing considerable tomcat around. If I was going to preach no more, I got to get married. Why, Tommy, I'm a lusted after the flesh. Me too, said Tom. Say, the day I come out of McAllister, I was smoking. I run me down a girl, a whore girl, sh like she was a rabbit. I won't tell you what happened. I wouldn't tell nobody what happened. Casey laughed. I know what happened. I was fast in, in the, into the wilderness one time. And when I come out, the same damn thing happened to me. Hell, it did, said Tom. Well, I save my money anyways, and I give that girl a run. Though I thought I was nuts. I should have paid her, but I only got five bucks to my name. She said she didn't want no money. Here, roll it under here and grab it a hole. I'll tap her loose. Then you turn that out that bolt, and I turn out my end, and we'll let her down easy. Careful with that gasket. See, she comes off in one piece. There's only four cylinders of these here old dodges. I, uh, I took one down uh, one time. Got main bearings big as a cantaloupe. Now, let her down. Hold it. Reach up and pull down that gasket where it's stuck. Easy now. There. The greasy pan lay on the ground between them, and a little oil still lay in the wells. Tom reached into... One, uh, one of the front wells and picked out some broken pieces of Babbitt. There she is, he said. He turned the Babbitt in his fingers. Shafts up. Look, uh, looking back and we'll get the crank. Turn her over until uh, I tell you. Casey got to his feet and found the crank and fitted it. Ready? Reach. Now easy. Little more. Little more. Right there. Casey kneeled down and looked under again. Tom rattled the connecting rod bearing against the shaft. There she is. What you suppose done it? Oh, hell, I don't know. This buggy been on the road 13 years. It says 60,000 miles on the speedometer. That means 160, and God knows how many times they turn their, the numbers back. Gets hot. Maybe somebody let the oil low and just went out. He pulled the, uh, the cotter pins and put his wrench on a bearing bolt. He strained and the wrench slipped. A long gash appeared on the back of his hand. Tom looked at it. The blood flowed evenly from the wound and met the oil and dripped in the pan. That's too bad, said Casey. One I should do that and you wrap up your hand? Hell no, I never fixed no car in my life without cutting myself. Now it's done, I don't have to worry no more. He fitted the wrench again. Wished I had a crescent wrench he said, and he hammered the wrench with the butt of his hand until the bolts loosened. He took them out and laid them with the pan bolts in the pan and the cotter pins with them. He loosened the bearing bolts and pulled out the piston. He put piston and connecting rod in the pan. There, by God, he squirmed free from under the car and pulled the pan out with him. He wiped his hand on a piece of gunny sacking and inspected the cut. Bleeding like a son of a bitch, he said. Well, I could stop that. He urinated on the ground, picked up a handful of the resulting mud, and plastered it over the wound. Only for a minute did the blood ooze out. Then it stopped. Best damn thing in the world to stop bleeding. Handful of spider web will do it, too. 
I know, but there ain't no spider web, and you can always get pissed. Tom sat on the running board and inspected the broken bearing. Now, if we can only find a 25 Dodge and get a used Conrad and some shims, maybe we'll make her all right. Al must have gone a hell of a long ways. The shadow of the billboard was 60 feet out by now. The afternoon lengthened away. Casey sat down on the running board and looked westward. We're going to be in the high mountains pretty soon, he said, and he was silent for a few moments. Then, Tom, yeah, uh, Tom, I've been watching the cars on the road. Then we passed, and then that passed us. I've been keeping track. Track of what? Tom, there's hundred families like us going, all going west. I watched. There ain't none of them going east. Hundreds of them. Do you notice? Yeah, I noticed. Why? It's like, it's like they was running away from soldiers. It's like a whole country moving. Yeah, Tom said. There's, there is a whole country moving. We're moving too. Well, suppose all the folks and everybody, suppose they can't get no jobs out there. God damn it, Tom cried. How do I know? I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. I done it at Mac for years, just marching in cell and out of cell, and in mess and out of mess. Jesus Christ, I thought it'd be something different when I come out. Couldn't think of nothing in there, else you go stir happy. And now, can't think of nothing. He turned on Casey. This here bearing went out. We didn't know it was going, so we didn't worry none. And now she's out, and we'll fix her. And by Christ, that goes for the rest of it. I ain't gonna worry. I can't do it. This here little piece of iron and Babbitt. You see it? You see it? Well, that's the only goddamn thing in the world I got my mind uh, on. I wonder where the hell Al is. Casey said, now look, Tom. Oh, what the hell? So goddamn hard to say anything. Tom lifted the mud, uh, mud pack from his hand and threw it on the ground. The edge of the wound was lined with dirt. He glanced over at the preacher. You're fixing to make a speech. Well, go ahead. I like speeches. Warren used to make speeches all the time. Didn't do us no harm and he got a hell of a bang out of it. What are you trying to roll out? Casey picked the backs of his long, naughty fingers. There's stuff going on and there's folks doing it. Them people laying one foot and down in front of the other, like you, like you says, they ain't thinking where they're going, like you says, but they're all laying them down the same direction, just the same. And if you listen, you'll hear a moving and a sneaking and a rustling and a restlessness. There's stuff going on that the folks doing it don't know nothing about yet. There's gonna come something out of all these folks going west, out of all their farms left lonely. There's gonna come a thing that's gonna change the whole country. Tom said, I'm still laying my dogs down one at a time. Yeah, but when a fence comes up at you, you gotta climb that fence. I climb fences when I gotta climb fences to climb, said Tom. Casey sighed. It's the best way, I gotta agree, but there's different kind of fences. There's folks like me that climb fences that ain't even strang up yet and can't help it. Ain't that owl coming? Tom asked. Yeah, looks like. Tom stood and wrapped the connecting rod in both halves of the bearing in the piece of sack. Want to make sure I get the same, he said. The, t the truck pulled alongside the road, and Al leaned out the window. Tom said, it was a hell, a, a hell of a long time. How far did you go? Al sighed. Got the rod out? Yeah. Tom held up the sack. Babbitt just broke down. Well, it wasn't no fault of mine. No. Where'd you take the folks? We had a mess, Al said. Grandma got to Bellerin, and that set, uh, set Roshan off, and she bellied some. Got her head under a mattress and bellied. But Grandma, she was uh, lay, just laying back her jaw and band like a moonlit hound dog. Seems like Grandma ain't got no sense no more. Like a little baby. Don't speak to nobody. Don't seem to recognize nobody. Just talks on like she's talking to Grandpa. Where'd you leave him? Well, we come to a camp. Got shade and got water and pipes. Cost a half dollar to stay there. A day. But everybody's so goddamn tired and wore out and miserable, they stayed there. Ma says they got to because Grandma's so tired and wore out. Got Wilson's te tents up and got our tarp for a tent. You think, I think Grandma's gone nuts. <laughs> Tom looked toward the lowering sun. Casey, he said, somebody got to stay with this car and make sure she'll, uh, or she'll get stripped. You just as soon? Sure, I'll stay. Al took a paper bag from the seat. This here's some bread and meat Ma sent, and I got a jug of water here. She don't forget nobody, said Casey. Tom got in beside Al. 
Look, he said, we'll get back to just as soon as we can, but we can't be tell how long. I'll be here. All right. Don't make no speeches to yourself. Get going now. The truck moved off uh, in the late afternoon. He's a nice fella. He thinks about stuff all the time. Well, hell, if you've been a preacher, I guess you got it. Pa's all mad about it cost 50 cents just to camp under a tree. He can't see that nowadays. Set in a cussing. Says, next thing they'll sell you is a little tank of air. But Ma says they gotta be near shade and water, cause Grandma. The truck rattled along the highway, and now that it was unloaded, every part of it rattled and clashed. The sideboard of the bed, the cut body, it rode hard and light. Al put it up, put it up to 38 miles an hour, and the engine clattered heavily, and a blue smoke burn, uh, of burning oil drifted up through the floorboards. Cut her down some, Tom said. You're going to burn her right up, uh, right down to the hubcaps. What's eating on Grandma? I don't know. Remember the last couple of days she's been airing airy, saying nothing to nobody? Well, she's yelling and talking plenty now, only she's talking to Grandpa, yelling at him. Kind of scary, too. You can almost see him a sitting there and grinning at her the way he always done, a finger in himself and grinning. It seems like she sees him a sitting there. Too. She's just giving him hell. Say, Pa, he give me $20 to hand you. He don't know how much you're gonna need. Ever see Ma stand up to him like she done today? Not I remember. I'm sure... I sure did pick a nice time to get paroled. I figured I was gonna lay around and get up late and eat a lot when I come home. I was gonna... I was going out and dance and I was gonna go tomcatting and here I had time to do none of those things. Al said, I forgot. Ma gave a lot of stuff to tell you. She says, don't drink nothing, and don't get into arguments, and don't fight nobody. Cause she says she's scared you'll get sent back. She got plenty to get worked up about without me giving her no trouble, said Tom. Well, we could get a couple of bears, couldn't we? I'm just a raven for a beer. I don't know, said Tom. Pod crap a litter of lizards if we buy beers. Well, look, Tom, I got six dollars. You and me could get a couple pints and go down the line. Nobody don't know that I got six dollars, uh, six bucks. Christ, we could have a hell of a time for ourselves. Keep your jack, said Tom said. When we get out to the coast, and you and me will take her, and we'll raise hell. Maybe when we're working. He turned in the seat. I didn't think you was a fellow to go down the line. I figured you was talking him out of it. Well, hell, I don't know nobody here. If I'm going to ride around much, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have me a hell of a time when we get to California. Hope so, said Tom. You ain't sure of nothing no more. No, I ain't sure of nothing. When you killed that fella, did did you ever dream about it or anything? Did did it worry you? No. Well, didn't you never think it, about it? Sure, because I was sorry he was dead. You didn't take no blame to yourself? No, I done my time, and I done my own time. Was it awful bad there? Tom said nervously. Look, Al, I done my time, and now it's done. I don't want to do it over and over. There's a river up ahead, and there's a town. Let's just try and get a Conrad and the and the hell with the rest of it. Ma's awful partial to you, said Al. She mourned you when you was gone. Done it all to herself kind of crying down inside her throat. We could tell what she was thinking about, though. Tom pulled his cap down though over his eyes. Now look here, I suppose we talk about some other stuff. I was just telling you what Mom done. I know, I know, but I'd rather not. I'd rather just lay one foot down in front of the other. Al relapsed in the insulated silence. I was just trying to tell you, he added, after a moment. Tom looked at him, and Al kept his eyes straight ahead. The light and truck bounced noisily along. Tom's long lips drew up from his teeth, and he laughed softly. I know he was, Al. Maybe I'm kind of stern out, but I I'll tell you about it someday, maybe. You see, it's just something you want to know. Kind of interesting. But I got a kind uh, kind of funny idea. The best thing would be if I forget about it for a while. Maybe in a little while I won't be that way. Right now, when I think about it, my guts get all droopy and nasty feeling. Look here, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. The jailhouse is uh, just a kind of way of driving a guy slowly nuts. See? And they go nuts. And you see them and hear them. 
and pretty soon you don't know if you're nuts or not. When they get to screaming in the night sometimes you think it's you doing the screaming, and sometimes it is. Al said, oh, I won't talk about it no more, Tom. 30 days is all right, Tom said, and 180 days is all right. But over a year, I don't know. There's something about that, about it that ain't like nothing else in the world. Something screwy about it. Something screwy about the whole idea of locking people up. Oh, the hell with it. I don't want to talk about it. Look at this. Uh, look at the sun a flashing on them windows. The truck drove to the service station belt, and there, on the right side hand side of the road, was a wrecking yard. An acre lot surrounded by a high barbed wire fence, a corrugated iron shed in front of, in front with used tired tires piled up by the door and a price marked. Behind the shed, there were uh, there was a little shack built of scrap scrap lumber and tin, pieces of tin. The windows were windshields built into the wall. The gr in the grassy lot, the wrecks lay, cars twisted. Stove in nose, wounded cars lying on the, on their sides with the wheels gone, engines rustling, uh, rusting on the ground and against the shed, a great pile of junk, fenders and truck sides, wheels and axles, over the whole lot a spirit of decay, of mold and rust, twisted iron, half gutted engines, a mass of derelicts. Al uh, drove the truck up on the oily ground in front of the shed. Tom got out and looked into the dark doorway. Don't see nobody, he said. And he called, anybody here? Jesus, I hope they got a 25 Dodge. Behind the shed, a door banged. A specter of a man came through the dark shed. Thin, dirty, oily skin tight against stringy muscles. One eye was gone, and the raw, uncovered socket squirmed with eye muscles when his good eye moved. His jeans and his and shirt were thick and shiny with old grease, and his hands cracked and lined and cut. His hands, his heavy, pouting underlip hung sullenly. Tom asked, you the boss? The one I glared. I work for the boss, he said sullenly. What you want? Got a wreck, 25 Dodge. We need a Conrad. I don't know. If the boss was here, he could tell you, but if he ain't here, he went home. Can we look and see? The man blew his nose into the palm of his hand and wiped his hand on his trousers. You from hereabouts? Come from east, going west. Look around then. Burn the ca uh, goddamn place down, for all I care. Looks like you don't love your boss none. The man shambled close, his eye one eye flashing. I hate him, he said softly. I hate the son of a bitch. Gone home now. Gone home to his house. The words fell, stumbling. He got it away. He got away, a pickin' a fella and a tearing a fella. He, the son of a bitch, got a girl, 19, pretty, says to me, how do you like to marry her? Says that right to me, and tonight says, there's a dance, how do you like to go? Me, he says to me. Tears formed in his ears, and in his eyes, and tears dripped from the corner of the red, of the red eye socket. Some day, by God, some day, I'm gonna have a pipe wrench in my eye pocket. When he says things, he looks at that at my eye, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just take his head right down off his neck with that wrench, little piece at a time. He paint, panted with fury, little piece at a time, right down off his his neck. The sun disappeared behind the mountains. Al looked into the lot at the wrecked cars. Over there, Tom, look. That lo there looks like a twenty-five or a twenty-six. Tom turned to the one-eyed man. Mind if we take a look? Hell no. Take any goddamn thing you want. They walked, threading their way uh, among the dead automobiles to a rusting sedan, res uh, resting on flat tires. Sure, it's a 25, Al cried. Can we yank the pan off, mister? Tom kneeled down and looked under the car. Pan's already off. One rod's been gone. Looks like uh, one's gone. He wriggled under the car. Get a crank and turn her over, Al. He worked the rod against the shaft. Pretty much froze with grease. Al turned the crank slowly. Easy, Tom called. He picked up a splinter of wood from the ground and scraped the cake of grease from the bearing and the bearing bolts. How is she t for tight? Well, she's a little loose, but not bad. Well, how's she wore? Got plenty of shim. 
and been all took up. Yeah, she's okay. Turn her over easy now. Get her down easy there. Run over to the truck and get some tools. The one-eyed man said, I'll get you a box of tools. He shuffled off among the rusty cars, and in a moment, he came back with a tin box of tools. Tom ba uh, dug out a socket wrench and handed it out. You take her off. Don't lose no shins, and don't let the bolts get away, and keep track of a uh, cotter pins. Hurry up. The light's getting dim. Al called in the car. We ought to get us a set of sock wrenches, he called. Can't get in no place without a monkey wrench. Yell if you want a hand, Tom said. The one-eyed man stood helplessly by. I'll help you if you want, he said. No, nope. nope, the son of a bitch done. He come by, and he got on white pants. And he says, come, let's go out to my yacht, and by God, I'll wang him some day. He breathed heavily. I ain't been out with a woman since I lost my eye, and he says stuff like that, and big tears cut channels in the dirt beside his nose. Tom said impatiently, why don't you roll on, got no guards to keep you here? Yeah, that's easy to say, ain't so easy to get a job, not for a one-eyed man. Tom turned on him, now look here, fella, you got that eye wide open, and you dirty, you stink, you're just asking for that, you like that, lets you feel sorry for yourself, of course. You can't get no woman with that empty eye flapping around. Put something over it and wash your face. You ain't hitting nobody with no pipe wrench. I tell you, a one eye fella's got a hard row, the man said. Can't see stuff the way other fellas can. Can't see how far off the thing is. Everything's just flat. Tom said, you're full of crap. Why, I know a one-legged whore one time. Think she was taking two bits in an alley? No, by God. She's getting half a dollar extra. She says, how many one-legged women you slept with? None, she says. Okay, she says, you got something pretty special here, and it's going to cost you a half a buck extra. And by God, she was getting them too. And the fellas coming back thinking they're pretty lucky. She says she's good luck. And I know uh, a humpback in the in a place I was. Make his whole living letting folks look, rub his hump for luck. Jesus Christ, and all you got he is one eye gone. The man says stumblingly, Well, Jesus, you see somebody edge away from you, and you, and it gets into you. Cover it up then, goddammit. You're sticking it out like a cow's ass. You like to feel sorry for yourself. There, there ain't nothing the matter with you. Buy yourself some white pants. You getting drunk and crying in your bed, I bet. Need any help, Al? No, said Al. I got this here bearing loose. Just trying to work the piston down. Don't bang yourself, said Tom. The one eyed man said softly. Think somebody will like me? Why, sure. Tell him you done grown since you lost your eye. <laughs> where where are you fellas going? California. Whole family. Gonna get work out there. Well, you think a fellow like me could get work? Black patch on my eye? Why not? You ain't no cripple. Well, could I catch a f ride with you fellas? Christ, no, we're got so goddamn full we can't move. You get out some other way. Fix up one of these here wrecks and go by yourself. Maybe I will, by God, said the one-eyed man. There was a clash of metal. I got her, Al called. Well, bring her out. Let's look at her. Al handed him the piston and the connecting rod and the lower half of the bearing. Tom wiped the Babbitt surface and sighted along it sideways. Looks okay to me, he said. Say, by God. If we had a light, we could get this, uh, this here in tonight. Say, Tom, Al said, I've been thinking. We got no ring clamps. It's gonna be a job getting them rings in, especially underneath. Tom said, you know, a fella told me one time you wrapped some fine brass wire around it, the ring to hold her. Yeah, but how are you gonna get the wire off? You don't get her off. She melts and, you, and it don't hurt nothing. Copper wire would be better. It ain't strong enough, said Tom. He turned to the one eye man. Got any fine brass wire? I don't, I don't know. I think there's a spool somewhere. Where do you think a fella could get one of them patches one eye fellas wear? I don't know, said Tom. Let's see if you can find that wire. In the iron shed, they, they dug through boxes until they found the spool. Tom set the rod in a vise and carefully wrapped the wire around the piston rings, forcing them deep into their slots. And where the wire was twisted, he hammered it flat, and then he turned the piston and uh, tapped the wire all around until it cleared the piston wall. 
He ran his finger up and down to make sure that the rings and the wire were flush with the wall. It was getting dark in the shed. The one-eyed man brought out had uh, brought a flashlight and shown it in the, shown its beam on the work. There she is, said Tom. Say, what'll you take for the light? Well, it ain't much good. Got fifteen cents a new batteries here. You can have her for uh thirty five cents. Okay. And what we owe you for this here conrod and piston? The one eyed man rubbed his forehead with a knuckle and a lot of dirt peeled off. Well, sir, I just don't know. If, if the boss was here, he'd go to a parts book and he'd find out how much was the new one. And while he was working, he'd be finding out how bad you were hung up and how much jack you got. And then he'd, well, say it's eight bucks in the parts book. He'd make a price of five bucks. And if you put up a squawk, you'd get it for three. You say, it's all me, but by God, he's a son of a bitch. Figures how bad you need it. I seen him get more for a ring gear than he'd give for the whole car. Yeah, but how much am I going to give you for this here? About a buck, I guess. All right, I'll give you a quarter for this uh, here sock wrench. Make it twice as easy. He handed it over the silver. Thank you. And cover up that goddamn eye. Tom and Al got into the truck. It was deep dark. Al started the motor and turned on the lights. So long, Tom called. See you maybe in California. They turned across the highway and started back. The one-eyed the one -eyed man watched them go, and then he went through the iron shed to a shack behind. It was dark inside. He felt his way to the mattress on the floor, and he stretched out and cried in his bed. And the cars whizzing by on the highway only strengthened the walls of his loneliness. Tom said, if you told me we'd get this here thing and get her tonight, I said you was nuts. We'll get her all right, said Al. You gotta do her, though. I'd be scared to get her uh, too tight and she'd burn out, or too loose and she'd hammer out. I'll stick her in, said Tom. If she goes out again, she goes out. I got nothing to lose. Tom peered into the dusk. The lights made no impression on the gloom, but ahead, the eyes of a hunting cat flashed green in reflection of the lights. Make sure you sure give that fella hell, said Al said. Sure to tell him where to lay down his dogs. Well, god damn it, he was asking for it. Just patting himself because he got one eye, putting all the blame on his eye. He's a lazy, dirty son of a bitch. Maybe he can snap out of it if he knew people was wise to him. Al said, Tom, it wasn't nothing <laughs> I'd done burned out that bearing. Tom was silent for a moment, then I'm going to take the, a fall out of you, Al. You just scrabble an ass over tit. Fair someone going to put some blame on you. I know what it, what's the matter. Young fella, all full of piss and vinegar. Want to be a hell of a guy all the time. But goddamn it, Al. Don't you keep your guy up when no one ain't sparring with you. You're going to be all right. Al did not answer him. He looked straight ahead. The truck rattled and banged over the road. A cat whipped out from the side of the road, and Al swerved to hit it, but the wheels missed, and the cat leaped into the grass. Nearly got him, said Al. Say, Tom, you heard Connie talking how he's going to study nights? I've been thinking maybe I study nights, too. You know, radio, or television, or diesel engine. Fella might get started that way. Might, said Tom. Find out how much they're going to sock you for the lessons first, and figure out if you're going to study them. There was fellas talking taking them male lessons in McAllister. I never knowed one of them that finished up. Got sick of it and left them slide. Almighty, we forgot to get something to eat. Well, Ma sent down plenty. Preacher couldn't eat it all. Be some left. I wonder how long it'll take us to get out of California. Christ, I don't know. Just plug, her, uh, plug away at her. They fell into silence, and the dark came, and the stars were sharp and white. Casey got out of the back seat of the Dodge and strolled to the side of the road when the truck pulled up. I never expected you so soon, he said. Tom gathered the parts in the piece of sacking on the floor. We was lucky, he said. Got a flashlight, too. I'm gonna fix her right up. You forgot to take your dinner, said Casey. I'll get it when I finish. Here, Al, pull off the road a little more and come hold the, flash uh, the light for me. He went directly to the Dodge and crawled under on his back. Al crawled under on his belly and directed the beam of light. Now in my eyes. There, put her up. Tom worked the piston up into the cylinder, twisting and turning. The brass wire caught a little on the cylinder wall. With a quick push, he forced it past the rings. 
lucky she's loose or the compression stop her. I think she's going to work all right. Hope that the wire doesn't clock her rings, said Al. Well, that's why I hammed her in flat. She won't roll off. I think she'll just melt out and maybe give the walls a brass plate. Think she might score the walls? Tom laughed. Jesus Christ, them walls can take it. She's drinking oil like a gopher hole already. Little more ain't gonna hurt none. He worked the rod down over the shaft and tested the lower half. She'll take some shim. He said, Casey! Yeah, I'm taking up this here bearing now. Get out that crank. Uh, get out to that crank and turn her over slow when I tell ya. He tightened the bolt. Now, over slow, and as the angular shaft turned, he worked the bearing against it. Too much shim, Tom said. Hold it, Casey. He took out the bolts and removed thin shims from each side and put the bolts back. Try her again, Casey, and he worked the rod again. She's a little bit loose yet. Wonder if she'd be too tight if I took out more shim. I'll try her. Again, he removed the bolts and took out another pair of thin strips. Now try her, Casey. That's good, said Al. Tom called. She any harder to turn, Casey? No, I don't think so. Well, I think she's snug here. I hope to God she is. Can't hone no babbit without tools. This here socket wrench makes her a hell of a lot easier. Al said, boss of that yard, gonna be pretty mad when he, come, when he looks for that size socket and she ain't there. That's his groan, said Tom. We didn't steal her. He tapped the cotter pins in and bent the ends out. I think that's good. Look, Casey, you hold the light while me and Al get this here pan up. Casey knelt down and took the flashlight. He kept the beam on the working hands as they patted the gasket gently in place and lined the holes with pan bolts. The two men strained at the, strained at the weight of the pan, caught the end bolts, and then set in the others. And when they were all engaged, Tom took them up little by little until the pan settled evenly against the gasket, and he tightened hard against the nuts. I guess that's her, Tom said. He tightened the oil tap, looked carefully up at the pan, and took the light and searched the ground. There she is. Let's get oil back in her. They crawled out and poured the bucket of oil back in the crankcase. Tom in inspected the gasket for leaks. Okay, Al, turn her over, he said. Al got into the car and stepped on the starter. The motor caught it with a roar. Blue smoke poured from the exhaust pipe. Throttle down, Tom shouted. She'll burn oil till that wire goes. Get her th get him thinner now. And as the motor turned over, he listened carefully. Put up the spark and let her idle. He listened again. Okay, Al, turn her off. I think we done her. Where's that meat now? You make a, go a darn good mechanic, Al said. Why not? I worked in the shop a year. We'll take her good and slow for a couple hundred miles. Give her a chance to work in. They wiped their grease-covered hands on bunches of weeds and finally rubbed them on their trousers. They fell hungrily on the boiled pork and swigged the water from the bottle. I like to starve, said Al. What are we going to do now? Go on to the camp? I don't know, said Tom. Maybe they charge us an extra half buck. Let's go and talk to the folks. Tell them we f we're fixed. Then, if they want to sock us extra, we move on. The folks will want to know. Jesus, I'm glad Ma stopped us this afternoon. Look around at the with the light, Al. See, we don't leave nothing. Get that sock wrench in. We may need her again. Al searched the ground with a flashlight. Don't see nothing. All right, I'll drive her. You bring the truck, Al. Tom started the engine. The preacher got in the car. Tom moved slowly, keeping the engine at a low speed, and Al followed in the truck. He crossed the shallow ditch, crawling in low gear. Tom said, these here dodges can pull a house in low gear. She's sure ratioed down. Good thing for us. I want to break that bearing in easy. On the highway, the dodge moved along slowly. The 12 volt headlights threw a short blob of yellowish light on the pavement. Casey turned to Tom. Funny how you fellas can fix a car. Just light right in and fix her. I couldn't fix no car, not even now when I seen you do it. Gotta grow her, grow into her when you, you're a little kid, said Tom said. It ain't just known, it's more than that. Kids now can tear down a car without even thinking about it. A jackrabbit got caught in the lights, and he bounced along ahead, cruising easily, his great ears flopping, flopping with every jump. Now and then, he tried to break off the road, 
but the wall of darkness thrust them back. Far ahead, bright lights, headlights appeared and bore down on them. The rabbit hesitated, faltered, and then turned and bolted towards the lesser lights of the dodge. There was just uh, there was a small, soft jolt as he went under the wheels. The oncoming car swished by. We sure squashed him, said Casey. Tom said, some fellas like to hit him. Gives me a little shakes every time. Car sounds okay. Them rings must have broke loose by now. She ain't smoking so bad. You done a nice job, said Casey. A small wooden house dominated the campground, and on the porch of the house, a gasoline lantern hissed and threw its white glare in a great circle. Half a dozen tents were pitched near the house, and the car stood beside the tents. Cooking for the night was over, but the coals of the campfire still glowed on the ground by the camping places. A group of men had gathered to the porch where the lantern burned, and their faces were strong and muscled under the harsh white light, light that threw back the black shadows of their hats over their foreheads and eyes and made their chins seem to jut out. They sat on the steps, and some stood on the ground, resting their elbows on the porch floor. The proprietor, a sullen, lanky man, sat in a chair on a porch. He leaned back against the wall, and he drummed his fingers on his knee. Inside of the house, a kerosene lamp burned, and it, but its thin light was blasted by the hissing glare of the gasoline lantern. The gathering men surrounded the proprietor. Tom drove the Dodge to the side of the road and parked. Al drove through the gate in the truck. No need to take her in, Tom said. He got out and walked through the, white, uh, through the gate to the white glare of the lantern. The proprietor dropped his front chair legs to the floor. He leaned forward. You men want to camp here? No, we got folks here. Hi, Pa. Pa, seated on the bottom set, said, thought she was going to be all week. Get her fixed? It was pig lucky, said Tom. Got a part before dark. We can get going first thing in this morning. That's a pretty nice thing, said Pa. Ma's worried. Your grandma is off her chump. Yeah, Al told me. She any better now? Eh, well, anyway, she's sleeping. The proprietor said, if you want to pull in here and camp, it'll cost you four bits. Get a place to camp and, and, and water and wood, and nobody won't bother you. What the hell? We can sleep in the ditch beside the road, and it won't cost nothing. The owner dr uh, drummed his knee with his fingers. Deputy Sheriff comes on by in the night. Makes it tough for ya. Got a law against sleeping in at, uh, out in the state. Got a law about vagrants. If I pay you half a dollar, I ain't a vagrant, huh? That's right. Tom's eyes glowed angrily. Deputy Sheriff ain't your brother-in-law by any chance. The owner leaned forward. No, he ain't. And the time ain't come yet when us local folks got to take no talk from you goddamn bums neither. It don't trouble you not to take our four bits, and when we get to be bums. We ain't asked you for nothing, all of us bums, huh? Well, we ain't asking no nickels from you for the chance to lay down and rest. The men on the porch were rigid, motionless, quiet. Expression was gone from their faces, and their eyes, in the shadows of their hats, moved secretly up to the face of the proprietor. Pa growled, come off of it, Tom. Sure, I'll come off of it. The circle of men were quiet, sitting on the steps, leaning on the high porch. Their eyes glittered under the harsh light of the gas lantern. Their faces were hard in the hard light, and their, they were very still. Only their eyes moved from speaker to speaker, and their faces were expressionless and quiet. A lamp bug slammed into the lantern and broke itself and fell into the darkness. In one of the tents, a, ma a child wailed in complaint, and a woman's soft voice soothed it, and then broke into a low song. Jesus loves you in the night. Sleep good. Sleep good. Jesus watches you in the night. Sleep, oh. Sleep, oh. The lantern hissed on the porch. The owner scratched in the V of his open shirt, where a tangle of white chest hair showed. He was watchful and ringed with trouble. He watched the men in the circle, watched for some expression, and they made no move. Tom was silent for a long time. His dark eyes lo looked slowly up at the proprietor. I don't want to make no trouble, he said. It's a hard thing to be named a bum. I ain't afraid, he said softly. I'll go for you and your deputy with my mitts. Here, now, or jump Jesus. But there ain't no good in it. The men stirred, changed positions, and their glittering eyes moved slowly upward to the mouth of 
of the proprietor, and their eyes watched his lips to move. He was reassured. He felt that he had won, but not decisively enough to charge in. Ain't you got a half a buck? He asked. Yeah, I got it, but I'm going to need it. I can't just set out and set it out just for sleeping. Well, we all got to make a living. Yeah, Tom said. Only I wish there was a way to make her without taking away her away from somebody else. The men shifted again, and Pa said, We'll get moving smart early. Look, mister, we paid. This here fella is a part of our folks. Can't he stay? We paid. Half a, do- half a dollar a car, said the proprietor. Well, he ain't got no car. Car's out on the road. He came in a car, said the proprietor. Everybody leave their car out there and come in and use my place for nothing. Tom said, we'll drive along the road, meet you in the morning. We'll, wa- oh, we'll watch for you. Al can stay and jo- Uncle John can come with us. He looked at the proprietor. That all right with you? He made a quick decision with a concession in it. If the same number of stays that can't come and pay, that's all right. Tom brought out his ba- his bag of tobacco and a limp gray rag by now with a little damp tobacco dust in the bottom of it. He made a lean cigarette and tossed the bag away. We'll go along pretty soon, he said. Pa spoke gently to the circlet. It's dirt hard for folks to tear up and go. Folks like us that had our place. We ain't shiftless. Till we got tractored off, we was people on the farm. A young, thin man with his eyes sunburned yellow turned his head slowly. Croppin, he said. Sure, we was share Croppin. Used to own the place. The young man faced forward again. Same as us. Lucky for us, it ain't going to last long. And we got, uh, we'll get out west, and we'll get to work, and we'll get growing land with the water. Near the edge of the porch, a ragged man stood. His black coat dripped torn streamers. The knees were gone from his dungarees. His face was black with dust and lined where sweat had washed through. He swung his head toward Pa. You folks must have a little nice pot of money. No, we ain't got no money, said Pa, uh, pa said, but there's plenty of work uh, us to work, and we're all good men. Get good wages out there, and we'll put them together. We'll make it out. The man stared while Pa spoke, and then he laughed and his laughter turned into a high, whinnying giggle. The, other, the circle of mad faces turned to him. The giggling got out of control and turned into coughing. His eyes were red and watering when he finally controlled the spasm. You going out there? Oh, Christ. The giggling started again. You going out there and get good wages? Oh, Christ. He stopped and said shyly, Picking oranges, maybe? Gonna pick peaches? Pa's tone was dignified. We gonna take what they got. They got lots of wor- uh, stuff to work in. The ragged man giggled under his breath. Tom turned irritably. What's so goddamn funny about that? The rag man shut his mouth and looked sullenly at the p- uh, porch boards. You folks all going to California, I bet. I told you that. You didn't guess nothing. The rag man said slowly, Me, I'm coming back. I've been there. The faces turned quickly towards him. The men were rigid. The hiss of the lantern dropped to a sign, and the proprietor lowered. The front chair legs to the porch stood up and pumped the lantern until we, the hiss was sharp and high again. He went back to his chair, but he did not tilt back. The rag man turned toward the faces. I'm going back to starve. I'd rather starve over uh, all over at once. It. Pa said, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, I got a handbill says they got good wages, and a little while ago I seen a thing in the paper that says they need folks to pick fruit. The rag man turned to Pa. You got any place to go? Back home? No. Where I said Pa. We're out. They put a tractor pack past the house. You wouldn't go back then? Of course not. Then I ain't gonna fret you, said the man. Of course you ain't gonna fret me. I got a hand bill. That says they need men. Don't make no sense if they don't need men. Cost money for them bills. They wanna put and put them out if they didn't need men. I don't wanna fret you. Pa said angrily. You done some jackassing. You ain't gonna shut up now. My handbill says they need med. You laugh and and say they don't. Now, which one's a liar? The ragman looked down into Pa's angry eyes. He looked sorry. Handbill's right, he said. They'll, uh, they need men. Then why the hell are you stirring us up? Laughing. Because you don't know what kind of men they need. What are you talking about? The ragman reached a decision. Look, he said. How many men they say they want on your handbill? 800. And that's in one little place. Orange color handbill? Why, yes, give me the name of a fella. Say Sue. Hey, say so and so. Labor contractor. 
Pa reached in his pocket and brought out the folded handbill. That's right. How'd you know? Look, said the man. It don't make no sense. The fellow wants 800 men, so he prints out up 5,000 of them things, and maybe 20,000 people seize them, and maybe two, 3,000 folks get moving account of this here handbill. Folks, that's crazy would worry. But it don't make no sense, Pa cried. Not till you see what uh, the fella that put out this here handbill. You'll see him, or somebody that's working for him. You'll be a camping by a ditch, and you and 50 other families. And he'll look in your tent and see if you got anything left to eat. And if you get, if you got nothing, he says, want a job? And you'll say, I sure do, mister. I sh I'll sure thank you for a chance to do some work. And he'll say, I can use you. And you'll say, when do I start? And he'll tell you where to go and at what time, and then he'll go on. Maybe he needs 200 men, so he talks to 500, and, and they tell f other folks, and when you get to the place, there's a 1,000 men. This here fella says, I'm paying 20 cents an hour, and maybe half a, half a men walk off, but there's still 500, so uh, that's so goddamn hungry, they'll work for nothing but biscuits. Well, this here fella's got a contract to pick them peaches, or chop that cotton. You see now? The more fellows he can get and the hungrier, the less he's gonna pay. And he'll get a fellow with kids if he can, cause hell, I says I wasn't gonna fret ya. The circle of faces looked coldly at him. The eyes tested his words. The ragged man grew self-conscious. I says I wasn't gonna fret ya, and here I'm a-doing it. You, you gonna go on, you ain't going back. The silence hung on the porch, and the light hissed and a halo of moth swung around and around the lantern. The ragged man went on nervously. Let me tell you what to do when you meet that, that fella says he got work. Let me tell you. Ask him what he's going to pay. Ask him to write it down what he's going to pay. Ask him for that. I'll tell, I tell you men, you're going to get fooled if you don't. The, pro the proprietor leaned forward in his chair, the better to see the ragged, dirty man. He scratched among the gray hairs on his chest. He said coldly, you sure you ain't one of these here troublemakers? You sure ain't a labor faker? <laughs> and the ragged man cried, I swear to God, I ain't. And there's plenty of them, the proprietor said, going around stirring up trouble, getting folks mad, chiseling them. There's plenty of them. Time's gonna come when we string them up, all them troublemakers. We gonna run them out of the country. Man wants to work, okay. If he don't, the hell with them. We ain't gonna let him stir up trouble. The ragged man drew himself up. I try to tell you folks, he says, something it took me a year to find out. Took two kids dead, took my wife dead to show me. But I can't tell you. I should have knew that. Nobody couldn't tell me, neither. I can't tell you about them little fellows laying in the tent with their bellies puffed out and just skin on their bones and shivering and whining like pups. And me running around trying to get work, not for money, not for wages, he shouted. Jesus Christ, just a cup of flour and a spoon of lard. And then the coroner come. Them children died a heart failure, he said. Put it, uh, put it on his paper, shivering they was, and their, their bellies stuck out like a pig bladder. The circle was quiet, and the mouths were open a little. The men breathed shallowly and watched. The ragged man looked around at the circle, and then he turned and walked quickly away from, into the darkness. The, sh the dark swallowed him, but his dragon footsteps could be heard a long time after he he had been gone. The footsteps along the road and a car came by on the highway, and its lights showed the ragged man shuffling along the road, his head hanging down and his hands in the black coat pockets. The men were uneasy, one of them. One said, well, getting late, gotta get to sleep. The proprietor said, probably shiftless. There's, uh, there's so goddamn many shiftless fellows on the road now. And then he was quiet, and he tipped his chair back against the wall again and fingered his throat. Tom said, guess I'll go see Ma for a minute, and then we'll shove along a piece. The Joe man moved away. Pa said, you suppose he's telling the truth, that fella? The preacher asked, answered, he's telling the truth all right. The truth for him, he wasn't making nothing up. How about us, Tom demanded, is that the truth for us? I don't know, said Pa. I don't know, said Casey. They walked to the tent, tarpaulin spread over a rope. It was dark inside and quiet. When they came near, a grayish mat steered, stirred near the door and arose to person height. Ma came out to meet them. All sleeping, she said. Grandma finally dozed off. Then she saw it was Tom. 
How'd you get here? She demanded anxiously. You ain't had no trouble? Got her fixed, said Tom, ready to go when the rest is. Thank the dear God for that, Ma said. I'm just a twittering to go on. Wanna, uh, wanna get where it's rich and green. Wanna get there quick. Pa cleared his throat. Bell was just saying, Tom grabbed his arm and yanked it. Funny what he says, Tom said. Says there's a lot of folks on the way. Ma peered through the darkness at them. Inside the tent, Ruthie coughed and snorted in her sleep. I washed him up, Ma said. Fuss water, uh, we got enough to give him a going over. Left the buckets out for you fellas to wash too. Can't keep nothing clean on the road. Everybody in? Us, all but Connie and Rose Sharon. They went off to sleep in the open. So it's too warm under, co under cover. Pa observed querulously. That Rose Sharon is getting awful scary and nimsy mimsy. It's her first, said Ma. Her and Connie sets a lot of store by it. You done the same thing. We'll go now, Tom said. Pull off the road a little piece ahead. Watch for us if you don't. If we don't see you. Be right. Uh, be off right hand side. I'll stand. Yeah. Leave Uncle John and come with us. Night, Ma. They walked away through the steep sleeping camp. In front of one tent, a low fit full of a fire burned, and a woman watched a kettle that cooked early breakfast. The smell of the cooking beans was strong and fine. Like to have a plate of them, Tom said politely as they went by. The woman smiled. They ain't done, and you'd be welcome. Come around in daybreak. Thank you, ma'am, Tom said. He and Casey and John walked by the porch. The proprietor still sat in his chair, and the lantern hissed and flared. He turned his head as the three went by. You're, you're running out of gas, Tom said. Well, time to close up anyway. No more half bucks rolling down the road, I guess. The chair legs hit the floor. Don't you go assassin me. I remember you. You're the one. Uh, you're one of these here troublemakers. Damn right, said Tom. I'm Bolsh uh, Bolshevsky. There's too many damn, uh, too damn many of you kind of guys ro around. Tom laughed as they went out of the gate and climbed into the dodge. He picked up uh, a clod and threw it at the light. They heard it hit the house and saw the proprietor swing to his feet and peer into the darkness. Tom started the car and pulled into the road, and he listened closely to the motor as it turned over. As it turned over, listened for knocks. The road spread dimly under the weak lights of the car.